I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar series of the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, CSIAC. Today's presentation is entitled Asymmetric Resilient Cybersecurity. My name is Steve Borzala, and I am the CSIAC Outreach Manager. A few administrative notes before we begin. First, all phones have been muted except for the presenters. Questions may be asked at any time during the presentation by utilizing the chat function. And time permitting, your questions will be answered at the end of the session. Today's briefing slides will be posted on our website within a few days. And finally, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank our sponsor, the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC. The funding that DTIC provides enables CSIAC to conduct these webinars. It's my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's webinar, Dr. Chris Oman from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Chris currently leads the Asymmetric Resilient Cybersecurity Initiative and also serves as chief scientist. His research is built on a foundation of high-performance computing applications, which emphasize the utilization of biological approaches as a new paradigm for other fields, such as cybersecurity. Dr. Oman has led efforts exploring various connections between sequence analysis and national security applications, including analysis of software binaries and network traffic. Chris has had led multiple efforts focused on adaptive resilient cyber systems. His resilience and active defense research rely on a foundational application of biological principles for survivability and regeneration. Chris earned both his MS and PhD degrees in biomedical engineering from the University of Memphis, University of Tennessee, HSC joint program. I will now turn the presentation over to Dr. Oman. Good afternoon, Chris. Uh, I guess in your case, uh, good morning, and the floor is now yours. Uh, thanks, Steve. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah, it's loud and clear. All right. So, uh, yeah, as Steve said, I am here at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Uh, I'm leading, currently leading our <clears throat> uh, Asymmetric Resilient Cybersecurity Initiative. Uh, this initiative is uh, an internally funded, <clears throat> an internally funded collection of research uh, <clears throat> that is focused on thinking about cyber systems in terms of resilience instead of uh, traditional defense. And partly because of my background in biology, um, uh, this will, I, I think the ideas of resilience will sort of come across um, uh, as we go through. So I'm going to advance to the next slide. There we go. Right. So. Um, first, just a little word about Pacific Northwest. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, we are a Department of Energy lab located in central Washington state. We are a multi-program lab, meaning that we do work for lots of different sponsors, lots, lots of different um, uh, agencies and stakeholders. And a large part of our business is focused on national security. <clears throat> So a lot of the national security work that we do, <coughs> excuse me, I'm a little under the weather today. Uh, a large part of the national security work we do is focused on transitioning basic and applied sciences uh, and using them to solve specific problems that are in the national security side. And that's kind of where our interest in resilience comes from. Uh, we have a very multidisciplinary approach to resilience that comes from biological sciences, from epidemiology, uh, from high-performance computing, from graph uh, analysis, and lots of other uh, science domains. And we're applying these different things in a very multidisciplinary way to solve specific problems in cyber. And the specific problem I'm going to talk about today is cyber resiliency and some of the work we're doing there. Um, under so, so you may hear me use the word initiative. So, uh, our idea of asymmetric resilient cybersecurity is an internally funded uh, collection of projects. Initiatives at Pacific Northwest tend to live uh, four or five years. They tend to be funded at about the level of uh, 15 to 20 million dollars total. 
So all the work that I'm going to show is this internally funded stuff that we're doing that is supposed to be uh, exploratory, sort of higher risk, um, sort of early stage research, but we're always looking for ways that that research can be applied to specific problems out in the world. Um, and that is where, that's part of the reason we do presentations like this one, uh, because we're always interested in <clears throat> uh, connecting with different folks that have uh, real mission needs. All right, so the two main things I'm going to talk about today are resilience and asymmetry. And the resilience stuff I'm going to talk about is mainly focused on how do we how do we impart complex cyber systems with this property that we want them to have of resiliency as a way to augment what we're currently doing for normal cybersecurity. But the question is really, how do we do this in a measurable way? How do we do this in a way where we can be sure that what we're doing is actually helping the system in some ways? Um, and also that it's uh, shifting the advantage to the defender. And that's where the asymmetry piece comes in. <clears throat> so I'll be talking about uh, resiliency first and some of the work we're doing there, and then some of the stuff we're doing specifically around asymmetry. Um, the, the resiliency work is going to be more on uh, work that we're already doing in some of the different research areas there. The asymmetry part of the conversation is going to be a little more notional and sort of blue sky. Uh, and that's where I invite a lot more participation from other folks, you know, after the fact or, or going forward around this idea. So to start off with the resiliency work that we're doing, um, we, we are very focused on, like I said, kind of looking out ahead in terms of what sort of ways could we take these basic and applied sciences that we're, that we're known for here at the lab and applying those to specific problems out in the world. As we do this, we're focused, uh, if you look at the bottom of the slide, we're focused on two different regimes in cyber conflict. We think about pre-boom, and by that all we mean is, what can I do to a complex cyber system to put it into motion, to scramble things, to make it harder for an adversary to find what they're looking for or to manipulate the system even in the absence of knowing that the adversary is there. So this is not about finding them and kicking them off or figuring out what they want. It's, it's about looking inward at these systems. What can I do to make them more complicated? Now, we're not the only ones working in this area. There are lots of other folks working in different facets of this, moving target defense, um, deception, um, in different areas. And what we're interested in doing is, is not competing with those, but, but understanding those technologies, bringing them into our measurement platform, and then being able to say something definitive about the extent to which those things actually impart resilience, and do they do it in a way that's financially, or not, not just in terms of money, but in terms of the asymmetry of the conflict, do those things actually benefit the defender, or are they, are they more costly than they're worth? The other regime that we focus on is what we think of as sort of during or post boom. And this, this is about, can I sense that I have lost some sort of important functionality in my institution or in my complex cyber system? And can I regrow that functionality? So again, the key is not to find an adversary and figure out that they've infiltrated some particular piece of the system. The, the point is, these systems exist to serve a purpose. They, they exist to serve a mission, to do something specific. And how do we make sure that the, the ability of the collective system is still proceeding as it needs to be? So that goes by some other names, continuity of operations, uh, mission-oriented uh, defense. The, these things all play a part in that. But so we, we care about both sides of the coin. What do we do without knowledge of an adversary to make things more difficult for them? And what do we do when we lose functionality in order to grow that back? Now, as we think about resiliency, um, we're thinking about it from a very, a very science-minded point of view. And so part of our perspective is that we presume breach. Now, not everyone is ready to, to presume breach. And so we realized this. And as we've gone, we've, we've invested in lots of different specific technology areas that we needed to do. To do 
in order to get to resilience. But a lot of these areas we're investing in, in research-wise, also solve other problems. And those problems tend to be a little more tactical. And so I want to make sure that I point those out as we go. So the, the black bar across the top of this slide lists a whole bunch of different areas. And, in, and again, these are not areas that we're going into with the perspective of, um, of starting from scratch and, and trying, to, uh, trying to solve the whole problem. But I think that our perspective in, in resilience in this multidisciplinary approach um, are, are, are potentially going to change the way we think about some of the more um, traditional areas like situational awareness and decision support, um, threat awareness and coordinated response and those sorts of things. And as we go through this, I'll, I'll call out specific examples of that as we go. Okay. Oops. Jumped ahead. Okay. So, so what are we doing? When, when we think about resilience, we are focusing on the, the loop in the center, the discover, reason, decide, act loop. Um, the, it's kind of a relabeled OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, act. But the important detail here is that it's turned inward. So you, instead of observing a battle space and figuring out what's going on, we're discovering the state of our own cyber system. And then we're going to reason over that to try to understand what that means about our state. And then through decision support, try to figure out what our options are and prioritize those in terms of a lot of different aspects and then act. And w w there's kind of a raging debate as to how much of that acting should be automated and how much of that should be um, driven by a human. We tend to think of human on the loop or a human enabled loop because humans can't always react fast enough to be relevant for cyber conflict. But certainly there are things that a human could and needs to be there for. Uh, and so kind of where, where the human ends up in all this is, is, is an active question. But if you think about what, what we're, the sorts of things we're doing on the discover part of this loop are, could be thought of as sensing. But what we're doing is rather than just developing new sensors, what we're trying to do is use graph and topology based and other kinds of models where you take traditional data, uh, traditional kind of host based data, and come alongside that with these topological or graph based models. And these, these other models actually bring context outside of just the host. So I've, you, know, you could have a traditional sensor that says, here's what's happening on the host, here's what my IDS says, and then you have a more graph-based or topological-based thing that's saying, and here's how that fits into the bigger picture. One of the challenges with graph-based measures historically has been, how do you act on them? How do I just throw a graph back at a person and say, here's what it looks like, go do something that's the right thing? So rather than actually displaying graphs for humans or for computers, what we're doing is using graphs and topology as sources of new kinds of state information. So they give us new measures and metrics that apply to the state that we use to describe the state of these complex cyber systems that allow us to do a better job of actuation. Uh, and so there's some interesting things that we have there, and I'll talk about that as we go. If you combine that with reasoning, what that gives you is, is a, a new kind of situational awareness that maybe wasn't there before. If you combine all of that with decision support, and the decision kind of stuff we're working on is inspired by game theory, uh, but it's a very different way of doing game theory. And the reason game theory doesn't always work in cyber is that it requires you to have a lot of information about what the adversary is doing, what, what you're doing as a defender, what the different moves are that are possible, the impact of those moves. And the reality is during a cyber conflict, a lot of that data is not available. And so our take on, on the decision support side of this there's, there's a planning piece, what do I do to build a better system in the first place? But then there's kind of a real-time piece. How do I, in a completely uncertain environment where I don't necessarily know what the adversary is doing or what their moves have been or what their payoff is, um, how do I do anything? And these guys have, have, have devised a very interesting way of approaching that through um, probability distributions and, and bringing that into the, the idea of game theory. Um, when you combine that with um, actuators, and by actuator all we mean is something that reaches back into a complex cyber system and makes a change based on what has been seen. Um, when you bring that all together, you now have an active cyber defense kind of loop. And so, so the, the action is not about, uh, it, it is very inwardly focused. How do I navigate? How do I move things? How do I reconfigure? How do I take things offline in a very rapid way? 
but also in a, in a way that measurably improves the, the posture of the defender. And so that, that's what we mean by active cyber defense. Okay, so in terms of the platform, so this is one of the things that we have um, put a lot of effort into. We, we realize there are a lot of folks working in the different areas that I just pointed out, um, not all of them for an active cyber defense um, application. But um, one, of the, one of our issues is that we realize that we need experimental repeatability. Um, we, we need a platform that we can regard as, a, as an experimental device. And so we have built, using our own testbed infrastructure here at Pacific Northwest, we have built a fake company. Uh, and, and for our purposes, we assume that this fake company has, a, has an energy appropriate mission, but that mission is defined. This company is built on OpenStack, so we have a lot of virtualized systems, but it has um, routing, it, it, has, it has virtual switches, it has um, endpoints, it has different enclaves, it has user enclaves and service enclaves. It has all the sorts of things that you would expect um, a real corporation of around, you know, large number of hundreds or low number of thousands of employees to have. So it's not huge, but it is certainly big enough to give us an experimental platform where we can introduce um, background uh, signal. And that background signal is, is driven by the infrastructure that we built and also we're using the MIT Lincoln Labs Lariat uh, user modeling system. So we're in the process of, of finishing up some of those models so that we actually have agents essentially on each of these virtual systems driving applications, sending emails, emails get sent through the network. They will certify their time cards and, and that sort of thing. And, and all of that together gives us a, as realistic of a background system as we can have. Into that system we will introduce, and we have been introducing what we call impediments. And so those could be naturally based, you know, power outage type things It could be accidental user doing something they didn't mean to do, all the way to probing an action on target. Um, the purpose for this, though, is remember our goal is not just to, to build some of these technologies because a lot of those are out in the world. What we're really trying to do is, is measure the extent to which these different technologies really do impact our, our, our resilience posture. And if, for, so from our point of view, that means how much they impact our mission. But also we want to figure out if it really changes the battle, the battle space. Is it, is it something that introduces a barrier to an adversary the first time through, but once they figure it out, it's back to them having all the advantages? Or are we really giving them a hard problem to solve that they just can't get around in some sort of simplistic way? Um, so, so what we do is we have our background system doing what it does, introduce an impediment, and we have a blue force that defends it using traditional tools. Um, and, and then what we do is we introduce these other technologies, in our case, this is DRDA loop, but we're actually looking for lots of other folks bringing bring another moving target uh, either into our DIRTA loop directly or to evaluate it kind of on its own. And then you have, so you have the baseline measure and then you have the other measure of, of what's the improvement in ability to maintain mission. The reason we have to do things this way is that when you think about resilience, a traditional red team whose job it is to do penetration testing is, is not sufficient because we presume breach. So the fact that we're assuming adversaries are already in it in some way means that a, a red team that successfully penetrates is just validating our, our starting point. So what we really have to do is kind of lock horns with an adversary and make multiple measurements um, where they try something, the, the environment shifts itself or defends itself in some way and tries to rebuild its ability to achieve mission. It's this kind of back and forth. So it's a much different, uh, a much more involved kind of, of measurement. But we're, we're in the process of figuring out just how that needs to be done and, and quantifying the degree of resilience, the ability to achieve mission, and then that asymmetric measure. Um, Okay, so these are some of the areas that we've focused in specifically because, um, as I said, there, there are lots of things out in the world that do different aspects of, of this DIRTA loop and, and the other things that we need. 
Uh, but there are specific things that we needed uh, that we were not able to find. So um, if folks on the line are aware of, of other examples of these, I'm always interested in hearing more about it. Uh, and I'll just say a few words about each of these areas. So I'm going to start in the kind of the upper left-hand area, passive asset dependency discovery. So you imagine now having a, an infrastructure that's constantly in motion, it's defending itself, it's reconfiguring or whatever. You need to have a lot of awareness about where your assets are and what they depend on and what depends on them. Doing this in a passive way is extremely important because it's, it's kind of unrealistic for us to go to someone and say, well, you can do all this, but you have to change the way packets are formatted. I mean, you know, that's, that's, that's not the way we want to do this. So we've, we've got some folks working on how to do this uh, using some interesting mathematics, and their, their focus is on using, using co-occurrence but imperfectly measured between events on a network to reconstruct these little dependency graphs. And, and it's not one great big one that describes the whole infrastructure. They're very small kind of localized dependency graphs. But they're very important because if, for example, if, you're, if your recommender is suggesting that your actuator should reconfigure some system, you really need to know what that system depends on. You may need to bring some things along for the ride. You also need to know what depends on it for the same reason. The other aspect of this project is that if you overlay what they're doing with the, the business process understanding, if you know a particular system is important, you now have a way of passively finding out what else it depends on and what depends on it. Uh, and so that, that, was an in, that was an important thing that we needed in order to do this in a way that makes sense. <clears throat> Moving to the right, uh, or um, yeah, the next one is uncertainty tolerant decision support. So that was the, the stuff I mentioned on the previous slide about how do you, how do you play games with an adversary um, beforehand or during a conflict to figure out what's really going on and what your next best move is, um, realizing that a lot of your a lot of your information is going to be imperfect. Um, the third one, I'm not going to say much about. We, we spent some time looking into homomorphic encryption. It, it's a large area that lots of folks are working in. Um, I think we had some interesting things to add there, but they're um, probably a little bit further out in terms of how how when they'll be ready for for uh, practical use. Um, I mentioned already uh, the next quadrant or the next triangle, model-driven situational awareness. Uh, we've had several projects looking into different mathematical graph topology, all sorts of different spectral methods to, to discern new kinds of state out of, out of cyber data sets. Now, typically, when you think of a network for a cyber data set, it's easy to think the fiber layout that connects systems, or the particular way that those systems are talking to each other at any moment as manifest through network traffic. But there are lots of other graphs you can, you can come up with. I mean, you can build graphs of credentials and how they're being used in different places. Uh, you can build graphs of dependencies between data in different locations. All of these things uh, give higher order models that describe different aspects of, the, of these complex systems, and all of those are fair game. So we're not just we're not just using NetFlow, or we're not just using uh, the actual fiber layout of, of of a networking infrastructure. There are lots of different things that we can do there. Uh, continuing around the circle, we've also spent a lot of time on our, our integrated test and evaluation platform. Uh, so that was the the fake company that I was telling you about, and then on the very left. Um, one of the things that we've realized is that you have to deal with the issue of, of people adopting the technology. Um, one of the things that's a barrier, one of the barriers that we have a lot of times when we work with cyber defenders is you may solve interesting problems, but if you don't do it in a way that natively fits into their environment and they're, they're basically their favorite tool set, you're kind of asking them to, to start over, to learn something new, or to take on yet another task in an already very busy day. So one of the things we did is we, we launched a human factor study to try to understand how cyber defenders were making decisions to use one technology as an example over another. And so we have a tabletop role-playing game that involves um, a, a roles, various roles of cyber defenders that have to work together. Um, they each have different perspectives. So there's your sort of person who's re responsible for frontline defense. There's kind of VP in charge of sales whose job it is to continue that the 
the, the infrastructure meet its goal or, or continue to make money if, if you want to think of it that way. Um, there's sort of an IT person whose job it is to keep the individual systems working, and, and there's, there's, there's another stakeholder, and the point is each of those people has a different perspective. And as they collude or try to work together to do a defense, they, they make decisions based on their perceptions of technology, what sorts of things they can add, um, what the risks are, what the, um, what the cost is. And so as we play through this game, we're, <clears throat> we're doing two things. We're learning how people make those decisions and what sorts of attributes this resilient technology needs to have and what ways we can describe it to people that make it impactful. But also, it has turned out to be a really interesting training tool because we've taken this out to several different companies and different places uh, as part of our data collection, but those folks are seeing a lot of value in, well, now I can actually bring these four real people into a room and now they know each other's names. You can even scramble the roles so that you have the person who's actually the VP playing the role of the IT defender or, or the IT person or the cyber defender. And it helps them understand why those people make the decisions they make and vice versa. And, and so this has sort of taken off as its own interesting uh, platform to do various uh, various training and so forth with. So so that's that's a quick overview of a lot of the stuff we're doing in resiliency specifically. What I'm going to do is switch gears, and, and, and this will get a little more notional than the stuff I've been talking about up to this point. Uh, and what I'm going to do is talk about asymmetry. And this was, we, we recognized early on that you might be able to realize resilience. You may even be able to realize perfect resilience. We can argue about whether that's true or not, but let's just say it is. But if it's, if it's infinitely costly, then we still lose. And so we wanted to bring some notion of how to understand that balance and cost into the work that we're doing in this initiative. And that's where the idea of asymmetry came in. And so the way we kind of think about asymmetry is, if you go historically, you can kind of think about it in this very simplistic way. So you know, here's us, we're the defender, uh, we have our crown jewels there, that's the thing we care about, and we have some very large defense that prevents someone from getting close to it. And so, and what we want is for our adversary to see this and, and run away screaming, uh, okay, I'll never, I'll never be able to have those crown jewels for myself. But that makes some assumptions. And what we learn over and over is that a, a simple landscape shift or the adversary doing something we didn't expect or making a different assumption completely changes the game. And so now all of a sudden our crown jewels, whatever that means, are, are actually threatened because in having this very large rock in our hand, we were assuming that they wanted to take it, which meant they had to get there to take it. But really maybe all this adversary wants is to remove the value of us having our crown jewels. Maybe they just want to destroy them. And so, you know, we didn't think about this other option and what that really means in terms of asymmetry. And, and so this is kind of where things start and then it escalates. So we think, all right, well, if you're going to attack us from above, we're going to ex expend some cost to defend ourselves. Let's say we wanted some sort of provable infrastructure. We could probably do that. Uh, we can say something about the angles of attack that this new defense will protect us against, the size of the rock, the velocity of the rock, all these different things. And we might even think that at that point we're safe, but as, as we all know, that's not what happens next. Uh, what happens next is the adversary makes a completely different set of assumptions and typically for a small cost, maybe for a large cost, but sometimes for a small cost, they do something different. Now they're, they're digging under the ground instead of attacking from the air. And so, you know, this is, a, of course, it's a sort of a silly, trivial example, but the idea is that that provable defense always requires some kind of assumptions about the space of moves that the adversary can make. But the adversary is not beholden to make those assumptions or to follow them because, and it's even worse in the cyber systems than it is in the physical world here, because we don't even really have physical law on our side most of the time. We've got, there may be some canonical equations somewhere that, that tell us what the limits are, but that's kind of still up in the air. So this is the situation that we find ourselves in. So, here we go. So now, we take this to an extreme. In today's terrain, we have these very complex infrastructures that have lots of different defensive mechanisms, but you know, in our world, the truth is these things are all in motion. We, we like to think we have taller towers or thicker walls, but in the cyber world, those, those don't mean the same thing that they do in the physical world. In the cyber world, we can 
clear the forest. We, there's, there's no forest to clear outside the castle. That, that works in the physical world because you can see an adversary coming because they can only go a certain speed over the land. You can marshal your resources to defend yourself in a particular place for a particular time. These are all things that the physical world helps us with that, that aren't there in the cyber world. So how do we start thinking about resilience when we set all this in motion? And how do we start thinking about making sure that when we get to resilience, we're doing it in a way that actually shifts that advantage away from the adversary and to us. So this is kind of our trajectory. What, what do we mean by asymmetry? We've had a couple workshops and meetings where we try to, you know, we worked with various folks from across the, the community. We're hosting a, you know, an international workshop. We just did one. We're doing another one in October um, called Safe Config, where we're looking at some of the economics of, um, of resilience and asymmetry. And then we need to do what we've, you know, we've already been focusing on, make this platform where I can start making measurements. We need to understand what that platform looks like. We need candidate technology. So we've built some, but we're much more interested in going out into the world and using what other folks have built and, and building some sort of phenomenological understanding about the properties of these things. Make repeated experimental measurements and then evaluate what's going on and try to see what we, what we can come up with. So, you know, as we think through the different aspects of this, like I said, we've hosted some meetings and workshops on asymmetry. And the one thing that keeps coming back over and over is that asymmetry is not an intrinsic property. You cannot just have an infrastructure and say, uh, you, you cannot look at a simple resilience scheme and, and tell us whether that shifts the asymmetric advantage. You have to talk about, in some way, the different entities engaged in the conflict before the word asymmetry has meaning that makes sense. I, I think a lot of folks kind of know, know it when they see it, but there are some, we need to quantify it in order to be to do something specific around it. So, you know, the, the kind of definitions we have are just disproportionate exploitable imbalance between competing parties. Um, that could refer to threat. You know, you could just have a large organization or, or small organizations threatening ones that are large or small. But it could also be action. It could be I, I do something simple that gets in the way of your very high cost attack or drives up the cost of your attack. But the point is, in the end, it, it's this notion of exploiting that imbalance in, in, in any one of many different aspects. Now, what's wrong with this for, for the scientists, it's not quantitative enough. I, I can't, there's nothing that I can measure yet. And there's this notion of disproportionate, but to have disproportionateness, I have to know with respect to what. What, what am I measuring? What's the numerator? What's the denominator? And then there's all sorts of other things that factor into this. There's you know, the value of the system, there's the risk is part of it, there's time, there's all these different things, and it's not yet clear how to put them together, but I'm going to walk you through kind of the, the thinking so far. So if we start with a very simplistic idea of what we mean by asymmetry, it might just be the ratio of attacker cost to defender cost. And so in the bottom, we have this continuum from, you know, where this ratio goes from zero to infinity, towards zero is kind of where we are today, and that asymmetry favors the attacker. If it were one, then that's kind of the point of symmetry where we're, we're equal. And then kind of as we go to infinity, that sort of favors us as defenders, and that's kind of where we want to be. And, you know, we could say something like cost is dollars, but it's also effort and time and risk and inconvenience. But most importantly, it's about impact emission. Maybe this makes sense if we have an, an equally resourced adversary and defender but maybe not. And so, so let's think a little higher dimension. And then this is a little bit busy, but, but I'll walk you through it. So what if instead of just a simple ratio, we think of asymmetry as, as a vector quantity? It, it's, got, it's got two different things in it. And so the, on the x, on the y-axis here, we have kind of attacker's efficiency. That's the value of what they're doing versus the cost of what they're doing. And on the x-axis, we have the defender's efficiency, the value to the defender versus the cost to the defender. And kind of where we are today is where the red circle is. You know, the, the attacker has a lot of value for low costs, and we're kind of flip-flopped. And that's not where we want to be. The, the line of symmetry is the, is the, is the, the x equals y line here. And where we want to be is in the lower right-hand quadrant. But what's interesting now that we've now that we're thinking about value and cost to both the attacker and the defender, there are multiple ways we could get there. If you want to focus on the attacker, you could change their value or their cost. If you wanted to focus on the defender, you could change our value or our cost. 
And the key is the value to an attacker is not the same as the value to a defender. So this actually opens up the door for some really interesting options in terms of asymmetry. So as a specific example, the value to me, if I were a company that had some R&D program that was developing some new product, if the value to me is enormous. If this thing gets stolen, I lose a strategic advantage, I lose all kind, I, I lose confidence in my new product, I lose a lot of stuff. It, it, depending on what the attacker wants, if they just want to steal that so that they can get there first, that's one option. If they wanted to steal it so they could sell it to someone else so that they could find a hole in it, that's another option. So those are different values. So they're very different values for the attacker and the defender. But what that means is maybe I could flood my own infrastructure with bogus copies of what this technology is. I would need to make sure that, that people who need access to the real stuff can get it and don't get confused by bogus copies. But that lowers the value to an attacker of what they get because they, it raises their uncertainty as to whether that's the real thing. On the flip side, you, you might wait until, you know, if you realize something were stolen, you could flood the outside world with garbage. That way, an attacker who has stolen something would have no way of verifying to someone who's going to buy it from them whether or not it's the real thing. So it, it's, it, it's, not a, it's not a huge epiphany, but, but it's an interesting point because what it means is it, it opens up the door for us to influence the value, not just raise the attacker's cost or lower our own cost. It also means, as we think about the defender's point of view, there's an opportunity to use cyber to increase the capital value of a system. So rather than just thinking of cyber defenses and cyber resiliency as a cost that you have to incur and balancing that against other factors, what if cyber resiliency had its own intrinsic value? What if we were able to figure out what that value is? And there are lots of folks working in this area of cyber valuation, cyber economics, uh, and I think that's another important piece that will that will change the equations, change the way we think about asymmetry. But, but now we've made the conceptual leap from a simple ratio to two more complicated ratios. This is probably an even higher dimensional thing. Um, how do we make sure that we understand what else belongs in this equation and put all the right stuff in there? There, there may be lots of other opportunities there. So this is kind of an open-ended question. So I wanted to touch just a little bit on um, bringing this all together. So we've got our platform for measuring resiliency and, and doing those uh, experimental measures. We have a way of attacking it and, and measuring the response of the system with or without the active, active cyber loop. We're in the process of figuring out what we mean by asymmetry and how to measure that. So now we're ready to do some, exper some experiments. And this is actual data that we, we generated back in March. We had a, a very a platform. We had three days of traffic, so so left to right, you're seeing three full days of traffic. We had two green and red lines are our sort of experimental graph-based models that we were building. We we were looking for lateral movements, movement um, event into this platform, and and then the question was, well, did did our these weird graph measures that we've come up with see anything? Uh, it, was, it was a pretty simple thing. We weren't even really ready to measure the whole resilience question, um, but we wanted to just answer simple questions like, okay, we have a graph measure. Does that does it really do anything? And this w turned into a very interesting conversation between our entire initiative. So this was you know, open and applied scientists, mathematicians, high-performance computing people, cyber defenders, the networking people, the cloud people, the guys that built the test bed. Um, we were kind of scratching our heads, and what we realized is that um, the, the infrastructure that we were using, we were making a lot of assumptions about, and they were all reasonable assumptions, but each time we tried to drill in and figure out why are these green and red metrics spiking where they are, they did not correlate with the thing we thought they should, and then so one of the folks told us, well, that's because they're probably, all of your computers are phoning home to the DHCP server at the same time, that's probably the anomaly they're really seeing. That sounded very, the, the timing seemed about right, it seemed very reasonable. But as, as experimentalists, we had to insist, okay, show us where that is in the data. And, and every time we asked, it turned out that it was more complicated than we thought. The, the, the data did not corroborate that idea that this was a simple thing to do. Another thing that happened was uh, we actually made, a, we, we unleashed more of a lateral movement than we intended to 
and fortunately for us, this was a completely isolated network where we do all this experimentation. It actually brought our, our, our little test system down, and you can see the green and the red metrics go to zero just as, around the time the black, which is the network traffic, spikes and kind of saturates. Well, that was because once the traffic saturated, we were no longer able, our sensors didn't work anymore. And so our metrics failed because the sensors weren't working, not because the data was doing something. And so we realized this was, this was a terrible place to start experimentally. So we stripped the system down to the bare minimum. We, we ramped it way down to a very small number of nodes doing nothing. And then we introduced the thing we were looking for, or, or sorry, the small number of nodes doing a very small amount of background traffic that was random, but, but we understood exactly what it was doing and we had the seed so we could, we could redo all these experiments. And so we repeated simple measures. We're, we introduced a ping sweep into this environment. We asked the question, did one of our graph metrics see anything and, and it spiked? That was great. And that's the, the red bar to the left. But we wanted to repeat that and find out, did it, does it spike to the same level every time or does the noise of the background traffic have some sort of influence on this? And it turned out in this case, it spikes to the same level the second time much later. And so this was, a, this was much more easy to interpret. So we stripped it all the way down to the bare minimum in a way that we could peer into the data and understand exactly what was going on. And what we've done since then is build our way back up to that complicated picture. But we've done it piecewise. We've raised the noise floor. We've looked at attenuating the ping sweep to see what that does to the signal. And, and various other things to understand what kind of biases are introduced by our system what kinds of things can we see? What sorts of things can we not see? And that, that's gotten us back to the point where we're now ready to start doing these full-on experiments uh, that we can actually interpret. So, so now we think about all the different technologies that various folks are working on for, for resilience. And you could imagine us as now the defender. Now I've got diversity. I've got different kinds of crown jewels. I've put them in motion. Um, so I've got moving target. Uh, I have redundancy, so that if I lose something, I've still got something. I've got my traditional cyber defenses, that's my big rock. Um, I've got some adversary tools, I've got my shovel so I can test out our environment. I've got this all wrapped in a layer of orchestration. Not yet sure what the cost of all that is. And again, we're hoping that at some point, we'll get to the point where the adversary just can't deal with this, or, or they'll have to go try to do something else. But the truth is, this is what happens. Um, the adversary invests some unknown amount of resources into building something we've never seen before. I don't know what this thing is. I don't know what its properties are. Um, I don't know when, if we see this in the wild, will, it, will our system be able to respond the way we expect based on all of our predictions or not? And so, so here we are, back kind of where we started. We, we've got thoughts about what asymmetry means. We have a lot of thoughts about what we, what we think resiliency means. We have a platform that will let us start making these rigorous, repeatable experimental measures on it. And now we're ready to go and answer this big question. And so this is the point where we're looking for, for linkages with all the folks in the room and, and other folks that you know. Um, we, we are really looking for partners who want us to try out their technology, who want us to put it in our own um, active cyber defense loop, um, people who want us to um, try their own technologies completely in the absence of resilience. Maybe it's just a moving target thing that, and you're not worried about for resilience, you're looking for something else. But as we build this platform, that's, that's one of our big goals. And so um, that's, I'll, I'll stop there and we can have some questions. Okay. Well, thanks, Chris. That was, uh, that was, that was some interesting, uh, Technology that you're uh, exploring there. So um, we do have we do have some questions that came in from from our attendees. So let's uh, take a look at those first. So uh, one individual is curious as to uh, what type of software framework you're utilizing to uh, implement your intelligent agents. Sure. So um, we are using. Uh, I don't, I'm, I'm going to give a couple answers and hopefully one of these will answer the question uh, the, the way it's intended. Um, we are using Java Enterprise to do all of our orchestration. So that's the thing that's bringing together the sensing and the actuation. Um, we realize that there are other orchestration platforms like uh, Mira from Florida Institute of Technology that we could be using. We're, we're in the process of talking to those folks. Um, we're using 
uh, OpenStack, typical OpenStack controls to do all of the building of the framework itself and control of that and doing snapshotting so we can um, spin up very quickly instances of the whole company, instances of different departments so that they could be reconfigured in different things. Okay, thanks for uh, for uh, answering that one. Uh, so one individual is uh, you know ask, asking about your system, and uh, the question that they're interested in does a uh, couple, couple different aspects. So does does your system uh, identify um, like not not only the loss of a function, but um, uh, capability, but then also uh, say a new uh, unacceptable, uh, you know, non-sanctioned function uh, appears. Does does your system, um, you know, uh, identify a new a, a new uh, uh, function that was, you know, not intended to be there? Sure. So um, that, that's a good question. The the thing we're mainly focused on functionality for is to tell us whether whether something's wrong. In order to discover if you have new functionality, you would have to know what functionality to look for. So I, I would I think of it slightly differently. I, I think there is a way to do that. But what you do is you look for unexpected state changes. So example, thinking about the passive asset dependency discovery tool. If if I've got a, a known collection of assets that depend on each other in a known way, and suddenly there's a new piece in that dependency, something, you know, could be a, a man in the middle kind of a thing. That's an example of new functionality. Now, your system might not know what it means or, or that it is functional. It would just look like a state change that, that leads to an action. Um, so if, if there are other thoughts about how to, how to capture new functionality, I, I'm very interested in that. But it, it's not something we've inherently worked on. Okay. Uh, let's see. So I, I think this is probably a related question. Does the uh, uh, does the system include confirming that no other aspect of the system has been affected negatively? So, uh, like I said, I think that's I think that's uh, related to that to that question. Yes. So so I I, I see the question now. Um, I think the the act part of the loop. Think of the act part of the loop as just pushing an actuation. So I'm going to do whatever it is that I think I should do. The very next thing that happens, because it's a loop, the next thing that happens is the discover phase. So after you actuate, when you do the discovery, if you discover that a new problem has arisen, it's sort of irrelevant whether it happened because of what you did or a new adversarial issue, or maybe you, you took a move and it moved the, st the system to a new state and it's just not where you need to be. And so the fact that you're constantly in this in this loop is the thing that will discover whether or not you still have the functionality you need. So yes, that, that idea is completely built into this. I see, I see another sub-question there. The value of cyber resiliency is diminished um, by each existing software fault. Yes, and it's much larger than the uh, the, the removing the fault. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, the uh, so there's another um, individual is wondering whether for for uh, wondering if you've considered either the goal G O A L agent language or or JSON. Have, have you looked at either of those uh, technologies? Yeah, so we looked at a variety of, of orchestration technologies. Um, the, the one we chose, the reason we chose uh, just Java Enterprise as a generic layer was it was going to let us quickly do what we wanted. We're very interested in moving to a, a, a more standardized orchestration than just the way we've done it. Um, we're staying away from agents per se, but but that may that may end up being part of the uh, part of the equation. So. I, what I could do is uh, connect the person that has that question with the team that's done our, our middleware framework because um, they, they did a full assessment of lots of different technologies out there that we might have used, and so that would uh, that might be a useful conversation. Okay, that, that'd be great. Yeah, that would be uh, that would be uh, 
it would be super. Uh, so uh, one of the, one of the things I want to check on is uh, you you so you've you know you indicated that you created this own little um, company you know to to run your experimental tests on. So uh, and and the the experimental platform that you've created. So it, it is. Um, I think you indicated that it would be possible for other folks to come in and and utilize the system and and if um, you know if folks are interested, how how exactly would they go about doing that? What what would be you know what would be the way to try to make something like that uh, uh, happen? So the we, yes, we're definitely looking for folks to work with uh, who either want to have their, their own copy of this infrastructure to run their own tests, because again, we're thinking of it like an experimental platform. Uh, so if, if there were others that were doing the same sort of thing, we could repeat each other's measurements and, and do some interesting things there. We are, we are already working right now with the CMU to start figuring out how to do their experiments here. There's some, there some issues about how do we set up the environments, how do we get, how do we get your stuff into our environment without allowing our environment to still be sort of network accessible during a test because if something bad happens, we don't want it to get out. Um, so, so there's some issues there, but, but we're working through that. And we're always looking for collaborators who want to use the environment. So the best thing to do is send, just send me an email. Um, so my email is there on, on the, this current slide. And just let me know who you are and what your technology is that you want to evaluate. And what I'll do is put you in touch with our test bed team uh, and our experimental unit and we'll we'll start to figure out how that would how that would go. Okay. That that's that's uh that's great. It's uh, nice to know that uh you know capability is uh, you know accessible and you know folks can uh uh you know utilize that and take advantage of it if they're if they're interested. That's uh that's that's awesome. Um so another another thing I'd like to you know try and get your Kind of opinion on your your assessment. Uh, you know, you've talked you talked about the, uh, you know, doing the measurements, the experimental measurements, and you know, running into the, you know, you had to, you had to scale things back and do some very simple tests in order to, you know, to understand things and get a better better picture of things. So, why you know, so why do you think it's you know really so hard to get these, um, you know, these these experimental measurements in, in these complex cyber systems? Do you have a, a sense of, you know, what, 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 what's driving that? Sure. Um, I, I, uh, I would even go so far as to say it's hard to make simple measures on even simple cyber systems. And one of the things that's driving that is that, that systems have been engineered to be maximally functional. A lot of, assumptions have gone into building them that way. They are not maximally observable. So they were not always built with the full transparency of what's going on under the covers. And so what you get are people, smart people with a lot of knowledge, still making untrue assumptions about what's happening under the covers. And so what we have to do is, is keep insisting as experimentalists, show me in the actual data where that is. Um, you can do something really simple, like have two systems talk to each other through a single switch or router, send a whole bunch of packets, and you might think, okay, I've dumbed down the system, I've turned off all the background stuff, but there's nobody else talking, this should be really simple. And it's almost always the case that when you actually go and make the observation, how many packets were sent, what happened on both ends, it's just more complicated. Um, and on top of that, so the system itself is built to do lots of things that are hard to see. On top of that, there are so many configurations and details under the covers that, that make it very hard to do the kind of interpretation that you need to do. So as an example, one of the problems we had is that our, we were doing some, some uh, ping, and, ping sweeps and scans and very simplistic things to, to take, take our uh, graph measures out for a test drive. And so, before we were doing all this live, what we would do is generate the data and then he kind of heave it over the fence to the, the analyst and they would look at it. And they kept coming back and saying, we see two spikes in this thing, but they're, they're off by hours. And then the, the attacker team would say, that's not right. You, you're missing something because one spike makes sense, the other one's completely wrong. Uh, and then we, we just couldn't really figure out what was going on. And finally, it was a, 
one of the virtual systems had a clock skew problem. And it was, it was actually the correct time. All the times were correct, but one of them was in a different time zone. Uh, I have no uh, idea how that happened, but, but it was <laughs> one of those things where you had to look at every piece of the data to make sure that what the, what the attacking people were giving to the analyst was correct. Because that one thing, you know, the, the analysts were in fact right. There were two things happening. But, but that could not be corroborated in ground truth from the <laughs> folks that actually did the attack. So th those two things together, the complexity and, and uh, untransparency, opacity, I guess, of the system, combined with um, the complexity of the configuration and actually making those measurements, it, it's, it's extraordinarily complicated. And, and I, I think it's why it's worth having an experimental platform like this where we put a lot of effort into understanding what kind of bias do we introduce, where do these little gotchas come in, and it's, it's a stable thing. We're going to keep using the same platform over and over and over to do a lot of measurements rather than just trying to have a test bed that could be reconfigured to do anything, which we have. But the value is in having this, this instantiation inside that, that test bed so that we, we can really understand what's going on and work out all those little experimental kinks. Uh, that's that's uh, yeah, that's really interesting. So I, that's a good good story. I appreciate the uh, you know your your okay. feedback there. So uh, one one individual one of the individuals uh, has a question on the attacks uh, uh, that are that are introduced into your test bed, and they're wondering if they're uh, created by a uh, you know a, a team of individuals, uh, humans uh, on a red team, or, or do you have some kind of an automated uh, tool that's, uh, that are introducing the attacks into your system? So right now, um, just as we get all the pieces wired together and verify that they're all working correctly, it's largely been human-driven. You can script certain kinds of attacks, but that's, uh, that's not the spirit of the question. So um, scripted attacks are really basically the same as just having a human do particular things in a particular order. But there are much more sophisticated attack tools out there that would try something. If it fails, they will turn left and try something different. And I think that's actually where we need to be um, for repeatability. The, the problem is I think we're probably always going to have to do both. So I will care about the automated tools because that will let us try a large battery of options kind of all at once. But I think we'll also have to have a human adversary because they will understand aspects of the environment that those tools won't. So for instance, one of the things that we want to make sure to avoid is to say, okay, so we have this sensing loop that's going to actuate, and as long as that doesn't get messed up or attacked, then the whole thing works. Well, if we do that, we've just moved the attack surface over. We haven't actually solved the problem. So ultimately, we're going to want to do testing on the infrastructure that does our sensing in response. But when we do that, that may have to be a human thing because tools may not understand how that works or how to take advantage of it. So I think in the end it's going to be a combination of both. Okay. And uh, there's just one other, uh, I guess, uh, comment. If you uh, uh, some somebody is suggesting if you haven't if you haven't participated, uh, I guess there's a test bed at DHS. Uh, Doctor Doctor Mom is uh, the head of the cyber security group there. Uh, have you have you uh, had any interaction with that, or is that is that something uh, uh, you you might want to check out in the future? Yes, we, we know Doug very well. Um, we, we, we talk to him often about test beds and, and testing. Okay, okay, great. Uh, well, we're we're right about uh, we're right about on schedule, and uh, I think I think we've uh, taken care of all the questions that have come in from the uh, from our participants today. Uh, I want to thank you, Chris, for taking the time to. Um, Share with us the info on the uh, the work you're doing. I, I think it's quite quite interesting. There's some. Uh, I think you're exploring a lot of good avenues. And and once again, thank you for for sharing your information with us. We appreciate it. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for the invitation and uh, and the chance to present for your for your group. Okay, well uh, that's it for this webinar, folks. And we hope to uh, have you uh, join us uh, next month. Uh, we're going to be taking a look at. Uh, what makes a good cyber operator? So that that'll be uh, that'll be in store next month. I think we're looking at the 22nd of September, and uh, hope to see you then. Thanks everybody. Have a good one. Bye bye.